If you're looking to sponsor the Anything Goes podcast and have your business promoted on this show, you can contact sponsor anything goes at outlook.com or you can call 07584 650 203 for more information. Make sure you click the link to subscribe to my YouTube channel and also click the notifications button to be notified for when my next podcast goes live. You can also follow me on my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest is. I hope you enjoy this week's episode. Thank you. We're on. We're on. Okay. <laughs> and today's guest, we've got Madeline Black. How are we? I'm good, thank you. Nice to be here. Thanks for being here. You're welcome. You've got a very um, heartbreaking and also powerful book called Unbroken. Yeah. It's a bestseller. Um, your story is very touching, very moving, but it's also very dark and it's a heartbreaking story. Um, if you could elaborate on the wee book a bit. Um, yeah, my story really is just a story of many people. When I was 13, I was gang raped by two American teenagers. There's no easy way to say it. Yeah. I just have to say it how it is. And then you were raped three more times before yeah. you were 18. And it was really, as I was saying to you before, I didn't really think about those rapes because mm. one of the many side effects I had after the gang rape when I was 13 was I became really promiscuous so I thought I had loads of bad sex but when I was writing the book it just occurred to me I said no and they said yes and they just carried on mm. anyway yeah that's it's grim and it's t difficult for yourself how do you feel when you speak out about this as well does it bring back a lot of memories and emotion for you yeah, now I really am in such a good place and it almost feels like it's my duty that if I can speak out about it then I really should because I know the power that comes when we share our stories I'm a storyteller for an organization called the forgiveness project because I many years later chose to forgive these two men and Marina calls us Marina's the founder she calls us story healers rather than storytellers and I have felt that so many times times mm -hmm. because i know when we spoke earlier and you said at the start you kind of a lot of people blame themselves for these these bad things and it's difficult the night it happened what would you what was the plans leading up to it or yeah well i had this friend at school who was just really cool <laughs> she just wore the best clothes and makeup and jewelry whatever and she suggested a night out and i said yes her mum was away and we both lied about where we were staying. She was meant to be staying at her grandma and I told my mum we were staying there and vice versa. So her, we went back to her mum's empty flat and it was the late 1970s and somehow we managed to buy a bottle of vodka. We took it to a local Mexican cafe in North London, which sounds pretty sophisticated, but it was pretty scuzzy. It was the type of place where just a load of Americans hung out and a few of them joined our table. I had never drunk before, so I got sick just really quickly and threw up everywhere. So we were kicked out. And then two of the young men from our table put us into a black taxi and went back to her mum's empty flat. And it just became very clear very early on that they weren't there to let me sleep off the alcohol, that they were there for something else. And how old were these boys, do you remember? They weren't much older than maybe 17 or 18. And the girl, the girl you were with, was she raped that night? Well, when we arrived, they put us into separate bedrooms. And in the morning, uh, I woke up and my friend was now in the bed next to me. She hadn't been touched at all. And I had injuries on my body. And did you report it then? I didn't report it, no, because one of the very last things that the, the worst one said to me, he held his knife against my throat and told me if I told anyone that he would find me and he would kill me. And I believed him. So that basically just drilled the fear into you to yeah, the worry, to quiet. yeah, that it would happen again, or because they, they urinated on you as well. Is that correct? They did. And actually, out of all of the painful things that they did to me, to me that was the worst mm -hmm. because that just really summed up how little they thought of me that I was just uh, worthless, nothing. And how was the experience after that? Then how was your life? for years because I know it took you years to yeah. come to terms. Well, I know now that what we can't speak about, I couldn't find my voice. It has to come out somehow. 
Mm -hmm. So I developed an eating disorder. I became anorexic. I had so many fears, phobias, anxieties. I used drugs and alcohol just to numb out, to push it far out of my head as possible. But really, worst of all was what it did to my mind. I just thought I was worthless, dirty, contaminated. And I ended up taking an overdose, which obviously didn't work. But I didn't even know I'd had my stomach pumped. I took so many pills. And when I woke up in hospital, I just thought, God, what a loser. You can't even kill yourself. You can't even get that right. So from there, I spent two months in a children's psychiatric ward. And when I was writing my book, I asked for the notes just to see if they had any idea how a normal 13-year-old girl turned into one who couldn't speak or eat or hated herself, but they had no idea, according to my notes. And then after that, my behavior just I just rebelled even more when I got sent home. I just partied hard, became really promiscuous because I was just too scared to say no. If a guy tried it on, I'd just let him do whatever he wanted. I was also scared that it would get violent like the last time. And it was one particular morning that I came home late. I snuck in about four or five. My parents would say, don't go out. So I would go out. My mum is waiting and she's shaking me saying don't you realize what could happen the danger you're putting yourself in inside my head I'm screaming the words but I couldn't write I couldn't find my voice so I I wrote it down on a note which I left on my pillow before I went to school and when I came back they said is it true and I said yes so they called my friend who was involved the other gun she said no it hadn't happened like I said it did they were nice boys and they just brought us home so I just felt really betrayed hmm. by her in that moment do you my, think, though, it could have happened to her and maybe she was too scared to admit it also? I've, I've thought many things, and I know I'll never really know, but I, I do think along those lines. Um, either the same thing happened to her and she numbed it out and blocked it out like I had done, or nothing happened to her and she couldn't really understand what mm. I was saying. This is one of the reasons why I want you on the show, but even though you've went through your trauma, mm -hmm. you've not let it defeat you because now you're empowering people. You're doing talks, and it's a, it's a subject that... Nobody really speaks about, I think it's a very thin line that people are maybe embarrassed to come forward, ashamed to maybe think that. The shame is crippling. The shame is toxic because it's such an intimate crime. It silenced me for years as well. I really thought that it was my fault that I'd brought it on myself. Mm -hmm. So when did you start coming to terms with it and kind of, because I know you've forgiven those men, which is a difficult thing to do, but to release and to move on with your life, no matter the crime, I think that's one of the, the best things to do to move on. What age did you start really going, okay, I'm not going to let these boys take control of my no, life? I, I don't know if it's really an age and I would say it's really, um, it's just like layers. You know, there's many, many layers to it and it's a process. I didn't get to this place overnight. So... When my drug taking was really bad, my parents suggested that I went away for a while to get away from the bad influences. So I went to Israel for a year. My mum didn't know that they grew grass on the kibbutz, so I, <laughs> I was fine for a while. But anyway, I met a Glaswegian towards mm -hmm. the end of my stay there, Stephen, who I'm still with 35 mm -hmm. years later. But he was the first guy that I felt safe with and I knew that I could trust him. And he popped the question after about five years and I said yes, but I had to remind him that... I told him I would never become a mum because I just thought giving birth was going to be like being raped again. And I just thought, I can't do that. I was so scared. The idea of men at my cervix, you know, my feet and stirrups, whatever the idea of mm -hmm. giving birth was in my head, it was completely wrong. I had two amazing home births in Glasgow, so it was very different. Um, but I just thought one day, if I never become a mum, then they've won. I am still handing them all my power and control. So I was determined to become a mum and I have three gorgeous girls, but to live my life as best as I could. But I saw that we can convince ourselves of anything because I really thought that motherhood had healed me, that I was fine. But I still had fears and phobias and insecurities. Um, you know, I'd get in my car, I'd put the buttons down straight away. If I went to a multi-story car park and I wasn't on the first floor, I would just drive out because I couldn't risk going in the lift in case mm -hmm. a man came in or so, so many ways. I couldn't put my wheelie bin down the end of the garden if it was dark because I was scared of the dark. In fact, it was when... Um, through my kids and training as a psychotherapist that I really saw my fears. When Anna went to high school, she wanted to take the bus like everybody else. I said, no, I'm just going to drive you to prime, like I did drive you to primary school. Very you know. protective. Yeah, so protective. I'm also a Jewish mother, so I have yeah. that, that gene in me as well. Um, 
And she said, no, she wants to take the bus. And then I saw, if I don't let her take the bus, I am overprotecting her. How will she ever be streetwise? You know, how will she ever learn to really look after herself? So I said, okay, you can take the bus. I gave her the money. I gave her a rape alarm. I told her not to listen to her music with her earbuds in, sit nearest the driver. She jumped on the bus and then I jumped in my car and I drove behind that bus. Mm -hmm. And I just thought, this is crazy. What am I doing to my kids? What will be the point of bringing them into this world if I just infect their mind with my fears? Cotton wool, but, but, which is very difficult because you've experienced that, so you know it can happen. A lot of people haven't, the majority of people haven't experienced that, so they're not aware of it as much as you. You're aware of it, so you're going to be protective to the day you die. But well, again, yes you and can... no, because now, I mean, Anna was clubbing at 15. She's now mm. nearly 26 next week. So she's very sensible now. She just bought a house and all the rest of it. But um, I had to let them live their life. And I, yeah. if I... If I never sh showed them how it was to live their life, they'd be living a limited life as mm -hmm. well. Or also if I never showed them what it is to just to be spontaneous, to be free yeah. and to be aware. You know, so I always said to them, I don't care if you've been drinking, doing drugs, whatever's happened, phone us. If ever you're scared, we will always come and get you. Mm -hmm. So the first time that Anna got really drunk, her friends wouldn't let her phone. And they just said, no, no, you can't phone. And in the end, she phoned. And then she said, they were scared of letting me know how drunk she was. And I said, we'll always come and get you. Yeah, but to... if you'd, maybe if you'd done that that night also, then you wouldn't have went through what you've been through. So it's a good thing that you can also come forward. When did you say to Stephen, did you tell him straight away or did you have to wait to build up some trust? I told him very uh, few details when I, mm -hmm. you know, after a year or so after meeting him. And it was only when um, Anna turned 13, the same age that I was, that I had all the nightmares, all the flashbacks, memories came back. And I went back to therapy again for about three years. That was the last time I went. And then my therapist suggested, you know, it'd be a good idea to tell him all the details. He didn't know all the details, just so he would understand why I'm in therapy for three years. Mm -hmm. But I was still so ashamed then. The only way I could tell him was in the dark, in bed, holding hands with the lights off. I couldn't look at him because the shame... The shame is so hard. You know, I thought if people knew that they would look at me differently as if somehow what had happened to me was a reflection of me. Mm -hmm. But I know now the shame never belonged to me. Yeah. It always belonged to Those them. Those boys. Always did. But we carry the shame as survivors thinking that people will look at us differently. Mm -hmm. And you've been blessed to get through it and to do what you're doing because a lot of people who go through that torment, drug abuse, like you say, you've went through that. Suicide comes into play, you've tried that, and it's difficult. We do uh, homeless work, and a lot of the people who come through have been abused when they were young, and a lot of them blame themselves, which is is so sad to, to think that. So for anybody watching that's been through any kind of struggle or went through like something you went through, what advice would you give for them? Sure, I would say it's never ever too late to find your voice. There's always support. Uh, you know, if you can find a therapist, Share your story. At, I mean, I've done lots of different therapies, some may be more alternative than the mainstream therapies. But the biggest thing that I've ever done has been to find my voice, to give it oxygen, to put it out there. You know, when we don't speak, it it kind of... Eats away at you. Yeah, but also what it did to me, it numbed me out. I was just existing, but I was on autopilot. I wasn't really alive or spontaneous. I was like a block of ice, you know? I was just numbed out. So really with my girls as well, I thought I have to show them that I can get past this, but also how to live my life. I was so concerned with my safety and my well-being that I was protecting myself from living, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. Mm -hmm. So when you started making all the changes, when you wrote your book, because your book's been out two years now, see when you wrote your book, because it's, it's been right into depth of actually the whole experience, does, how yeah. was that feeling? Well, it's interesting. So before I wrote my book, I've been going to workshops for many years by um, a teacher of life. I guess you would call him a shaman, a man named Imaho. Mm -hmm. And he suggested to me to write my story down. And I said, no way. <laughs> There's no way I'm going to let you read or anyone else read my story. This was in about 2010. And it took me about four years. I stopped and started that process many times. And one night it literally just flowed out of my fingertips and 12 pages had been written and he then said, great, I'd like to use it in one of the workshops. And I said, there's no way I can't let you use it. And he said, it's going to really help people. It's going to be good for you, but it will really help people, your story, to show them that you can go through extreme trauma, but you can come out of it as well. 
And so I thought, okay, well, I trust this man. He's been my teacher for 10, 15 years, and I allowed him to do that. But while he was um, at the workshop, it was in Switzerland, I was back in Glasgow, I had a sense of my words. I could feel them flying around the room, and I thought, the bugger, he has let them read what I had written, and it was very explicit. It was all the details, he said, to hold nothing out. And he did. He let them read what I had written. And I thought, I can never go back. I was so ashamed. But I thought, if I don't go back, um, you know, I need to I need to realise. Yeah, and I just thought, I was so... They knew everything about me. They couldn't know anything more intimate about me. So I went back to the next workshop for me. It was in Cork and Ireland. And walking in was just like being naked. I felt mm-hmm. so exposed. What I also didn't know was he told them, to give her some peace, show her some respect, don't say anything to her, just leave her alone. So I walked in, they all just kind of looked down at their feet. (laughs) Nobody Mm -hmm. even said hello. And I just, but I just thought, you know, well, they didn't kill me. I am still alive. I don't believe I'm my body. I don't believe I am the things that were done to my body. We're all so much more than Mm -hmm. than our events in life. And actually, after about four days, it's a four-day workshop, people couldn't keep quiet. They started to come forward and say, It happened to them too, or they shared different stories. Or there was one guy who said that um, he had been scammed in a business deal and this man owed him loads of money. But he said, if I can forgive these two men, he can just forgive that because he's holding on to all his anger. Mm -hmm. And he saw like me that if I, when I was holding on to anger, it only impacted me. They had no idea about me being angry at them. Yeah. The thing about, which I love about your book, at the back it says... um, you talk about your empowering story as she discovers our lives are not defined by what knocks us down. They are defined by how we get back up, which Absolutely. is very important. I do believe that it's it's not what happens to us that is important mm-hmm. in life, but it's what we do with it that matters. Yeah, it's about how we react to those situations. Absolutely. and We've all got trauma. Some people, trauma is worse than others, but it's how we deal with those traumas. And again, it's not about comparison. Mm-hmm. You know, all rape is is a total violation. Mm-hmm. It's not worse because I was 13 and there was two. It doesn't matter. You know, it's not about comparison Yeah, no, I was all. meaning just we've all got traumas, Absolutely. whether it's through rape or but, uh, losing but, loved ones. Or... But we have to really be with that trauma. Yeah. You can't just get to that decision overnight. Mm-hmm. This has been a process. Steady you process. Know, this is like 40 years ago now for yeah. me. So it's been a huge process. But um, it, it really is possible to walk it out. But you, you have to let the trauma yeah. do what it has to do mm-hmm. as well. Yeah, and you'll be working on yourself to the day you die. You'll be constantly working on yourself. But the fact that you're, you're speaking out about it is very empowering and I've got massive respect for that. So for going forward with your life after you released the book, how many people have actually came forward and spoken out and and helped? So many. Well, I shared my story with the Forgiveness Project Mm -hmm. in 2014, not that long after I had written my story out for Imaho and he shared it. And it was after that that I realised what Marina, the founder, calls us. When she calls us story healers, I really understood what she meant because so many people, just from my story going online, got in touch to say well me too this has happened to me Mm -hmm. men and women not just women first of all in this country then overseas I've had every day I get messages from people from just all over the world one of my uh, best examples and the reason why I speak out I've had brilliant interviews like yourself but uh, Thank you. the best one I have to say sorry well, I, 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 <laughs> sorry what's the, Trev- <laughs> <laughs> what's the Trevor McDonald I can't really you know. oh he's a legend I okay, don't mind I, know, okay. I don't mind playing yeah. setting fiddle to okay. him as long so, as I'm setting okay you're second to Sir Trevor <laughs> so but it was uh, obviously amazing to meet uh-huh. him but it's what took place once the radio interview had been aired my friend's mum told me her my friend told me that her mum had been listening and to cut a long story short, she was 81 and she told her daughter that day that she had been raped as a teenager and she had never told anyone and she ended 64 years of silence. <sighs> Fucking hell. So every time I speak, I think of her. Someone's coming forward. Yeah. And, and that's why, do you think that's gave you the purpose in life then to keep going and keep speaking Absolutely. out? Absolutely. You've Be- got some drive and purpose to realise, wait a minute, yes, it's happened, but now... You're helping save lives also. Yeah, my voice is now my my tool or mm-hmm. now my power and I intend to use it because it was the the courage of somebody else speaking out that helped me find my voice and I just intend to pay that forward. Yeah. And one of the good things is, is to realise that you're not alone. I think if people can accept that, how can people, where can they contact or where can they phone or 
What's what's that um, place you work for? Can people contact him on Facebook or anything? Is there a well, crisis centre? I center? am a counsellor at an organisation in Glasgow called the Tom Allen Centre mm-hmm. and they will see anyone with any issue or couples. But there's rape crisis, there's the Samaritans. But you don't necessarily have to find a therapist because not everyone can afford to pay Um Tom Allen, there's a donation service as well, so you don't actually have to pay mm-hmm. the full rate of, I think it's £45 as a fast track. But just to find someone, even if it's not a therapist, a friend, just to be listened to, to be heard and to be believed, there's nothing, mm-hmm. nothing more empowering than, than that. And if you can't find someone to speak to, write your story down, tell yourself your story mm-hmm. and read what you've written. Because we spoke about, when we spoke on the phone at the weekend, we were talking about obviously the porn industry and the way people are looking at sex. Do you think that's playing a major factor Absolutely. now? Absolutely. Um, I recently did a radio show, BBC Radio Humberside, and we had a vicar on, Vicar Becky, who was lovely. But she goes into schools and she talks about porn and consent. And shockingly, she said the average age for a child to access porn, eight years old. Eight. Because yeah. in your palm, you have this computer that's far more powerful than any laptop, eight years old. And I've read something else that boys think it's normal for girls to cry when they're having sex because they get their lessons from porn. Do you think the girls are crying then because they are not want to do it, but they're too scared to say no? Absolutely. Well, if you were enjoying it, would you be crying? Yeah, that's scary because is there enough it getting spoke about in schools? I don't know so much in Scotland, but... The vicar, Becky, that was on said in England and Wales, they do a program now called the Bikini Program or the Pants Program. And they go into primary schools and it's about not being touched in bikini areas. So your genitalia and your breasts. And it's to to let them know if anybody touches you there and they tell you it's a secret to always tell someone. Don't ever keep secrets if anybody tells you it's a secret. And you have the rights over your body. You have the right to say no. And I think... That's so important. I think Mm. we need to start at... um, Addressing that straight away. Yeah, at nursery level, even if it's not consent about sex. But, you know, I was forced to Mm -hmm. go and kiss my granddad or or go and say hello to this one, sit on Santa's Mm -hmm. knee. Do, are we actually ever given a choice? Yeah. Even well, as a little a child? Few, majority of abusers are manipulators as well. Yeah. So they can manipulate people's mind. And, and a lot of rape, we've spoke about it again, earlier again, a lot of rapes, even though as women, a lot of male as well. Men are raped Are as getting well. raped. Mm. But I would, for men to come forward as well, I'd imagine there'd be a lot more pride in it as well. It's, it's difficult hard. as well it's for a man to come because, forward. Because, um, again, with all the myths that are out there, people assume if you're male that you could fight them off. You're a big guy, you know, you're not your typical mm-hmm. victim. And there's no typical victim. That Babies are <coughs> raped, women and burkas are raped, yeah. men are raped. I recently spoke at a conference called Break the Silence, which is an organization in Kilmarnock. And there was a boxer, Callum Hancock, who spoke out. He's an amazing young man. He was just so powerful when he spoke. And he was 10 years old when he was raped. And you think he's a boxer, that he could mm-hmm. fight back. Um, but yeah, he spoke out. And for him to find his voice I know because it's not just going to help him it's going to help so many other yeah. men and women to come forward too yeah it takes a lot of courage absolutely because so, you're also in talks that maybe getting a documentary made on about your book as well yeah it's, there's been talks made but we will mm. need to wait and see yeah because your story is very fascinating even though I've spoke about it before it is heartbreaking but it's also empowering to help others so if anybody's watching get, how can people contact you uh, well, I'm all over social media, mm-hmm. so I have my website, madlaneblack.co.uk, but Twitter, Instagram, I'm mm-hmm. madblack65. <laughs> and uh, get involved and drop her a message if she's um, interested, because the story needs to be told more. Absolutely. I believe it needs to be out as much as possible, and that's why I wanted you on, because it's such a touchy subject. It makes people feel uncomfortable. Yeah. And, it, and to me, is I'm really touched when a, a man invites me on to mm-hmm. speak about rape because mm-hmm. I think that must be even harder than for a woman to speak about. I recently spoke at Awa's uh, community radio station, yeah. Asian Glasgow mm-hmm. radio station, and I spoke to Anne Breen and she said one of my colleagues said he'd like you to come on. And I think that's brilliant that more men are willing to speak about rape because... Women and men are raped, but the majority of the rapists are men. Yeah. You know? And it's good to come forward and uh, people, uh, if that old woman who 60 odd year held on to that silence. pain and hurt and blame and to hold on to that, it, it destroys your life because the body will release a chemical th- of that Absolutely. frustration and anger. And, and, and she said she was listening to the radio and she just heard a woman on the radio who understood. And I spoke about how I always thought it was my fault mm-hmm. that I was to blame and I'd brought it on myself. And that's what she told her daughter, that 
you know, I always thought it was my fault. And then she made me see it never mm. was. It was always his fault. How was the discussion with your mum and dad when you left the letter? Yeah, that was interesting because my dad was determined to go to the police, even though my friend said it hadn't happened like it had. And my mum was really quiet. And it took me many, many years to understand my mum's silence. She didn't want me to be examined. She thought I would have an examination by the police, which I know now, three years later, I wouldn't have done. And it was only when my dad had died many years later that I was having therapy again. My mum told me as an eight-year-old girl she had been raped. And my dad... They were married 40 years, five kids, never knew at all. She never, she was too ashamed. She could never find her voice. It was her friend's, her neighbor's dad. And every time my granny would send her to play, my mum would be raped by this man. She was able to tell her brother, who then told my grandparents, that he was charged and he was also abusing his daughters. And when he was in jail, my mum's family moved away and then they never spoke about it again. That's heartbreaking. Yeah. But as I said at the start, my story is the story of so many people. Mm -hmm. How do you feel, though, that the men are still at loose? Does, does it ever worry you that they've, they've committed more? They may have committed more rapes, but that is not my responsibility. No. I once had somebody sent me, I'm very lucky, I don't really get trolled at all, but somebody sent me a, a vile message saying, well, it's your fault because you never reported that they're out there raping again. I'm not responsible for a rapist decision. If your car's broken into and you don't report it, are you responsible because then your neighbour's car is broken into mm -hmm. as well? Yeah, that's no, definitely not your fault, no. but you're going to get trolls. You're going yeah. to get people questioning it. Even the girl who you're with that night denied th yeah. that it happened or denied. So because the book, because there's no one came to a conviction also, you're going to get people questioning it as well. So 99% I have had so much support mm -hmm. and so much love that... Yeah, I know it was the right thing to do. And now, you know, something about writing it all down with all the details, it just kind of shattered my shame. Mm -hmm. I don't really care. Mm -hmm. Who knows mm -hmm. anymore, you know, because that's not me. And, and it's a paradox because, yes, it is a part of me. Mm -hmm. And, yes, it did influence my life. And then it's not me. I'm not what happened to me. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, yeah you've, it's interesting. You've Everything's interesting. And yeah. we spoke about, because we spoke about ayahuasca. We did. I'm going to do a documentary next month in Costa Rica mm. to document the experience of ayahuasca. Yes, but you friend. were talking about, um, <laughs> what was the thing you were talking well, about? Well, I, I knew about ayahuasca, but ayahuasca can render you senseless. Mm -hmm. And when I was taking San Pedro. Like which, what is San Pedro? So San Pedro is also plant medicine, which mm -hmm. comes from Peru. A lot of the shamans in Peru will take San Pedro ayahuasca. And it's softer than mm -hmm. ayahuasca. So I wasn't rendered senseless because you will just really be, I don't know. Well, ayahuasca, you'll, I think You'll be emptying your body from both ends. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You apparently can shit yes. yourself. Yeah, oh, yes, I've yeah, done that as well, uh, yes. Because <laughs> uh, it's a, a four day, it's an eight hour process. We'll drink the tea yeah. and then we're there for eight hours apparently. It's not really a cup of tea. Yeah, yeah it's <laughs> a taste like shit I heard. It's revolting. Um, but apparently you get into your subconscious mind and try and reconnect with your soul and find out your purf purpose. I'm constantly searching. Because I'm drinking drug-free, I'm questioning it also. Why am I doing it? Because I, I want to do it for the right reasons. I'm going to document the experience. A lot of people have came forward and it's changed their life. For me, actually, it was a revelation taking mm -hmm. it. So San Pedro is softer, so I could move mm -hmm. around and, and be around. It was up in the highlands of Scotland. And it was a course. It was maybe 20 of us in, in that took it. And it just really strips you of any conditioning. Mm -hmm. So for me, every time I always went back to trauma, I always went back to being raped. I'd be in a fetal position, crying my eyes out, mm -hmm. you know, shaking, fighting. Mm -hmm. And it was, oh, for God's sake. And the very last time I took it, I've taken it about five times. I just went, OK, show me all the pictures. I'm going to sit here and I'm not going to let it affect me because after a while, you know, the, the pictures, when they came back, they come back with all the energy that was locked in when I was just 13. Mm -hmm. And I would shake in my therapy sessions. I would cry. I have thrown up in sessions. And it was very real. I started to get paranoid. I saw, thought that I could see them everywhere I turned. I was triggered left, right and center. But I just decided, show me all of the pictures. And I just sat as steady as I could by the river one day by myself and I saw it and it was just like watching a film and it didn't affect me. The sting had been taken out of the energy. Mm -hmm. How do you still get nightmares? Not anymore, no. no. So the three years when all these memories came back, I stopped myself going to sleep at night, which was really not a great idea. But I thought if I go to sleep, I'm going to get nightmares. All of my memories came back in my dream state. But when I went to sleep eventually, uh, 
I would just wake up and their faces would be above me and I would be fighting, screaming, kicking. Stephen was lying oh. in the bed next to me. Um, so it was hard. It must have been hard for Stephen as well to try and... To live with such a mad woman, yes. <laughs> <laughs> He's an old man. <laughs> but uh, it must have been difficult because to go through all that trauma and pain because he would have been battling it with you. Yeah. But it just shows you how strong a character he, he was. He, I really do believe that he was an angel sent to save yeah. me because I was on a path of self-destruct when I met him. And if I hadn't met him... I could have just ended up overdosing on drugs, becoming a prostitute. I mean, I was not far mm -hmm. off that. The little self-respect I had for my body was, it was so low, my confidence. And really, you know, love is always going to win. He yeah. showed me that I was lovable because I didn't believe it. I would drive him mad. I couldn't understand why he wanted to be with someone mm. like me. And I saw I was lovable. I could give love back in return. And I slowly started to learn to like myself and love mm. myself. Because you'd have been low in confidence, low in self-esteem. You would have been probably paranoid and insecure that why does he love me? Were you Could not understand. clingy? Were you like, don't leave me kind of no, person? No, I just question him and say, why do you want to mm -hmm. be with me? So we met <laughs> in Israel and I went back to London. He was in Glasgow and we would travel. It was before the internet. Mm -hmm. I know this seems weird. Before mm -hmm. I had to still phone him after six o'clock at night on the house uh -huh. phone. So we, I've got tons of letters. So two years backwards and forwards on the overnight bus, mm -hmm. which was a journey. How was Israel? It was great. I spent six months on a kibbutz and six months in a town called Ashkelon. And, you know, I could just shove it further down inside my head mm. because nobody knew me. Nobody knew my story. And I could just really pretend to be someone else. So how did your interview become about with Sir Trevor MacDonald? Ah. So really through the Forgiveness Project, uh, they just got in contact with me. They must have read my story online and they were doing a program about redemption. And it was myself and another young man who you would be really interested to interview a guy called John McAvoy, who was oh a, the the cyclist. Yeah, yeah, he was an armed robber. So his book is called Redemption, and the mm -hmm. show was about redemption. So he has gone from iron bars to iron man. Yeah, the the most the wanted power man. of yeah. sports. Yeah, yeah, the most wanted man to be now sponsored with Nike. He's sponsored with Nike exactly. Yeah. So I think they're making his book into a film as well. Yeah. So it's going to be an amazing film. He spent sixteen years in prison. He did, yes. But whilst he was in prison, his prison officer Darren um, discovered. He was amazing on the rowing machine. And so he broke world records whilst he was in prison. So they allowed him, remember you meant to be locked up most of the day. Mm -hmm. They allowed him to do a 24-hour row. He did a marathon on the rowing machine. And Darren said, you're really good at sport. And he said it was his escapism. It was his meditation or his mm -hmm. focus. He just rowed and rowed or did his thousand press-ups every day, mm -hmm. whatever he did. Yeah, I love that. He I was, love that. Yeah. But I think people who go through trauma... You've got to kind. We've got to replace it with something. We've got to replace it with something. And at that time, when I was going through my shit, it was through drinking drugs. It was in, to numb the pain. Yeah, it was to hide from it. Absolutely. But then you focus on to something. You you find a lane. But only a, it's hard as well because only a very small percentage are blessed to get out that pain and misery to try and speak about and awaken people to realise that anybody can change. Absolutely. Your prime example yourself, the boy that you spoke, is it John McAvoy? John McAvoy, yeah. Again, you can do it. I don't care how old you are, what your crime is or what you went through in your life, you can rewire your brain. You can change your life. You know, it's for me, it was about when I stopped minimising it mm -hmm. because when the memories came back, I didn't want to remember it. Um, it was just like a porn film running mm -hmm. go through my mind, but I was the star of that film. And so my three years of therapy... In the end, it wasn't the pictures that were causing the damage. It was my mind because I just refused mm -hmm. to believe it. I wanted him to make them stop and he kind of laughed. And mm -hmm. I realized I had to find a way to accept all that was done to me and learn to be okay with that. Is that the main thing? Is that the main, the, the number one to accept me, and yeah. to let go and, and forgive? Well, you know, I, I'm not here to preach forgiveness. Yeah, I know, I'm not I, here to say in order to heal, you need to forgive. But this mm -hmm. is how I did you. it. And it, to me, I look at it as like it was for giving me mm -hmm. a better chance. Because I fantasized for years about somebody kidnapping them, taking them to an empty flat, you know, beating them up, mm -hmm. raping them, torturing them for four or five hours, just like they had done to me. So they would get it. So they mm -hmm. would know the impact doesn't last for one night. It lasts for years. A lifetime. Yeah, it can do. It, I really, mm -hmm. I honestly can say I have no hate or any residue of trauma left in my body at all. I feel like it really has been, been lifted from your yeah. shoulders. And, and I think by speaking out about it has really helped. And I'm not suggesting that everybody gets onto a stage and speaks or shares yeah. their story publicly, but to 
give it oxygen to because it moves it then it doesn't mm -hmm. stay trapped inside us mm -hmm. when we can admit something because the minimizing it and denying it it was like this um jack in the box that i just kept pushing it mm -hmm. further and further down inside and then eventually the lid opened and i couldn't close it anymore yeah. So when you started getting into psychology kind of things, uh -huh. was that to try and understand the brain as well? Was that well, to yes. try and People think it's because yourself? of what happened to me, but I, my dad was a Holocaust survivor. Uh -huh. So I was always fascinated how um, people can come out of the same situation, but come out very differently. So his mum, his dad, his five brothers and sisters were all gassed in Auschwitz. His youngest brother was only six. Mordechai, they were all murdered there. But his aunt, uh, his aunt, my aunt, his sister survived. But my auntie Eva was schizophrenic, agoraphobic, paranoid. If she heard a motorbike outside her flat, she would call us and say the Gestapo were coming to get her. Mm. Years and years later, she stayed in and cleaned her flat. When she got out, she just wanted to get home. And my dad, if you met him, was five foot nothing. He loved life. He said, life is for living. I've met your mum. I've had five kids. I'm so lucky. And my mum also had her own trauma. She had her neck broken in an operation and was bedridden for a couple of years. And she listened to a hypnotherapist on the radio one day and went to see this man, Joe Keaton from Liverpool, incredible man. And she came home, she got rid of the nurses and all the people that were looking after the kids while she was bedridden, chucked all her pills away and said she's going to use her mind to heal herself. So I've had great teachers. My mm -hmm. parents have shown me that, not by what my dad said, but how he lived his life. I saw that, God, if he can get past that mm -hmm. and live a good life, surely I can get past this as well. Do you think that's what's helped us a lot then with the courage that they had to make the changes I and to understand so. the brain? Yeah, we're so yeah, I really think so. So I am a participant in a project called the Global Resilience Project, hmm. a project run by a Scottish woman called Emma Bell, and she's taken 50 of us. And we've all have different stories, but we've all overcome adversity in some way. And she wants to find our blueprint to see what we have. And there's, she's come up with nine characteristics, which I don't know all the nine yet. Mm -hmm. But we don't all do them, but we all do some of them. Mm -hmm. And she wants to use it for mental health, for businesses, just to help people improve and personally develop and expand mm -hmm. and become better human beings. And I'm, I'm fascinated by it as well. Yeah, I love all that because I, I believe we've all got a blueprint on who we want to be. Absolutely. But we are conditioned... You could, when you spoke about earlier about the jack in the box you're putting that down we can be like an onion wrap ourselves it's around in so many layers therapy is just an onion and that's I mean? been my journey you know I, I became a mum and I thought that was it mm -hmm. and I realised God no there's still so much fear and then there's another stage mm -hmm. and another stage there's so constant layers there's always layers yeah bastards yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so for uh, you're, you're talking everywhere just now you're yeah. you're um, well, including this show do you know what I mean obviously behind Trevor but I don't <laughs> mind that um, you're talking everywhere are you going to be travelling a lot with it now as well? Yes, I can now say I am an international speaker because I, I have spoke yeah. in South Africa <laughs> and hopefully in July I'm mm -hmm. speaking in the Maldives, which I know mm -hmm. is going to be really tough, but that's with UNICEF. So I'm so excited to be going to speak for them because mm -hmm. that is really where my heart is, to speak to disadvantaged women and children around the world and hopefully make a difference. So they, I'll be speaking at a women's conference and UNICEF want me to speak to 18-year-old girls and 18-year-old boys. And to me, that's really important yeah. to share my story is there a with them. Place, is there places in the world where it's higher rape well, than other places? When I was in places? South Africa, I was told that if you're a black woman, uh, you have more chances of being raped than getting an education. And that was just like sad, that. awful. Yeah. And I think it's is very prevalent in South Africa. Mm -hmm. It's a very violent place. I was in Johannesburg. so Because the murder rate's high there as well. Yeah. yeah. My friends live behind bars in their houses. There's metal bars. There's grids inside your house. So you can cut off parts of your house if you have a, a home invasion. They live behind electric gates, wires. They have security that drives around the streets. We have it easy here. Yeah. We can. We just don't realise our freedom, what we can do. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, I, be, I still believe the world is a good place, though, and always mm. try and see the good in everyone. Absolutely. But there is some oh, places... Oh, I, I that had are an good. amazing time there. I met yeah. brilliant people. Yeah. What great. about, would you get, going to get and try and get another book out? I don't know. You know, when I wrote that book, very much like when I wrote the 12 pages for Imaho, it suddenly... I went to hear a speaker. 
Mm. Normally all the Forgiveness Project events are in London and Marina contacted me and said there's one at Shawlands Academy and she said, is that near? I said, it's two minutes from where I live. I'm just in the south side of Glasgow. So I heard a woman speak called Marion Partington and her sister Lucy had been murdered by Rose and Fred West. And when I heard her speak, she just emanated this peace and she's also taken part um, in the Restore program where we go into prisons which I've started to do and we share our story with the Forgiveness Project. It's like a personal development course for prisoners with men and women and I bought her book which is called If You Sit Very Still and she had written inside Now You Must Speak. I hadn't started to speak publicly and that night I thought you know I could write my story down not to write a book but just for me and I started to see all my words flying around my head mm -hmm. and I just sat down every morning at my Mac and I just felt like a typewriter. I just mm -hmm. literally vomited the words <laughs> out, vomited a book. But about eight <laughs> weeks later, it was written. Mm -hmm. It was done. So I don't feel anything alive in me at the moment, but I feel I use my words. Mm -hmm. I, I use the spoken word rather than the written yeah, word. Yeah, but if your, your book's changing lives, so that should give you the inspiration and go, OK, what can I do now? And speak about your amazing journey now and what you're doing. Well, the next thing that's coming up, I don't know if you know, on June the 14th, there's TEDx in Glasgow. Yeah, I've seen that. So I am seen one of that. the speakers. Proud of you. Yeah. That's amazing. 2,000 people, yeah. which is a little bit scary. You're shitting yourself. Yeah, just a little <laughs> bit. But be fine. I'm trying not to think about it. But Annie Lennox is going to be the headline Love act. That. So that's incredible. And QC Helena Kennedy. Mm -hmm. So there's really strong mm -hmm. females that are standing yeah. on the stage speaking out. What about like, prisons and stuff? Is for in male prisons a lot of rape? Is the rape high in there? I think they say in America that the statistics of male rape is very high because of the male prison system. The sentence is over there like two hundred years as well. Like, they can run for like hundreds of years and yeah, the um, conviction rate for Scotland is very low. Mm -hmm. um, I recently went to hear a woman speak called Miss M. She doesn't give her real name. Mm -hmm. And she had a conviction, a criminal case against the man who raped her. And he was found not proven. And we only have this in Scotland. It's a very weird sentence because it suggests that we know you're guilty, but we don't have enough evidence to prove it. Mm -hmm. See, it's, that, that's another thing that people are scared to come forward with because it's such a difficult thing to get convicted of. It's such a... And why is that? Why is that then? If they well, know he's guilty, but yet there's yeah, not enough... So, well, she went on to have a civil case against this man and she won her case and he was sued for £80,000. He's now declared himself bankrupt so he doesn't have to pay her. Yeah, I've seen that in the papers yep. a couple of days ago, yep. I think. Yes, I went to hear her speak last week and she said it's never been about the money. It's about admitting what this man did to her, she now has injuries on her body that she'll never recover from, mm -hmm. the, the, the amount of force and violence that he used against her. Uh -huh. So the not proven, it needs to be abolished because it's such a weird message. But we can't be naive and think that jury members make their decision based on the evidence that they only hear in court that day. Evidence, uh, you know, we make our decisions by thinking absorbing all the rape culture messages, the messages that are given out. You know, there's a case recently in Ireland last year where the young woman that was raped by a gang as well, that were found not guilty, they were rugby players, she was wearing a lacy thong. And the judge said, well, what did you expect? You were wearing a lacy thong. That meant that you were up for it. So the women in Ireland are incredible. And the men, they all took to the streets, all wa waving their lacy thongs in the air. This is not an excuse to rape me. This is not an invitation. It doesn't matter what you're wearing. Because we know, as we said, babies are raped. Women in burqas are raped. Mm -hmm. It's not about your underwear. And if they got down to your underwear, surely, you know, that wasn't consensual as well. Mm -hmm. But surely that is then, the judge should be getting looked at then for saying that Absolutely. and using that as an excuse. Absolutely. Just because if you went to a strip joint and you've seen people cutting about with bras and pants, it doesn't give you the right to fucking rape them on the dance floor. Mm -hmm. So, but it's, it is a, it's a touchy subject that too many people don't want to speak about. So for you coming on to speak about that, I really appreciate that. And how can people get involved in your stuff or how can people reach out? And they just, they can Google me and they'll, they'll find me mm -hmm. on social media, my website or Twitter, Facebook page, yeah. Instagram. Yeah, because you're all over social media. I am a little bit. <laughs> but you know, we have to really be because, because I have a book, but because I speak out, but also because mm -hmm. as you said, it's good to know that you're not alone. So if I put on a post and someone will comment or people will, People will comment to me in private as well. They say, I've seen your posts, but I can't like them because I don't want anyone to know that yeah. I'm liking a survivor's post because then they might guess what's happened yeah, to yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. So it's still so hard to break that shame. So mm -hmm. I feel if I can speak out, it's almost like a duty. I have a mm -hmm. sense of responsibility that if I can do it, then I should. 
so uh, sorry before we finish up let's see your kids and stuff as well what age did you tell them did they know about your they experience? always knew but i always used kind of age appropriate language so mm -hmm. they always knew that two boys hurt me very badly yeah, so how would you approach it that way though for anybody that's maybe scared to tell their kids or scared to tell well because i was always the paranoid jewish mother i always <laughs> wanted to keep them safe and i realized um that sounds like i'm putting the the emphasis on the woman to keep herself safe, mm -hmm. but it's not what I mean, but I always wanted them to be aware of mm -hmm. situations, just to be a bit streetwise and yeah. not a bit too naive. You know, when you're mm -hmm. out with your friends and you, you've left your drink, don't go back to drinking. Yeah. Somebody could spike it, all mm -hmm. these kind of things. So I always told them from a young, young age exactly what had happened to me. And it's about communication. Um, they maybe didn't know all the details and they have got the book, but I don't think they've all read the book. Mm -hmm. I think Anna read the chapter about her. Mimi <laughs> read the very, very end page. And Layla, when she was actually 13, read the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Is she a lot like you? Uh, yeah, they're all very different yeah, too. Yeah, yeah. You have three and you think they're all going to be the same and they're all so different. But yeah, Different personalities. Uh, yeah. How is it though when you're... Obviously, because everybody's what a wee piece here now to tell your story. How does it drain you a lot that you're on autopilot now and talking about it? Or do you kind of get used to it because you're no, you, yeah, you know you're doing that, it for the greater good? actually okay. And it's interesting when I went for my TEDx interview, they said to me that I was too polished, that I wasn't raw and authentic enough. And it really made me think, well, where, what place do I tell my story from? And... I very nearly didn't get through, but somebody was doing a video who's now following me on my TED journey and they saw that I really got what they said. And it made me think, well, how do I tell my story every time? Because I have to remember, you've never heard it before or people that are watching or listening now, they've never heard it before. So I hope I don't say it from a place where, yeah, this happened and that was that, you know. Um, no, of course not, but I still... But it, it really, honestly, it really doesn't impact on me when mm -hmm. I share the story now. Yeah, and as your story, and it doesn't matter w what way you say it, there's no way you can, do you sit and cry when you tell it, or do you, you and, sit and... And sometimes it will surprise me, you know, I was I was invited to see a play by an uh, Irish writer, Louise O'Neill. I did some work for the Sexual Violence Centre in Cork, mm -hmm. and there was a production of her book called Asking For It. So it's about a young girl who's drunk and gets gang raped at school. So there's a lot of stuff resonated with me. And on the night when I was raped, what saved me or what helped me before I left my body completely was counting. There was a, a border that went around mm -hmm. the top of the walls made out of bows and I just counted them over and over again. Mm -hmm. And then the violence escalated. So I literally kind of left my body. And in this play, in the scene where she's being gang raped, this was only last year, I found myself leaving my body and the, the stage was made out of like windows and I just started to count all these windows and I thought, mm -hmm. oh my God, I didn't know that I could still do that. And it really mm -hmm. scared me and I just started to yeah. shake. I was sitting with my friend and she's just holding my hand. We were invited to go for a drink afterwards and I thought, no, I need to sit with this and just acknowledge mm -hmm. what's going on and be okay to ground myself again. Like an outer body get, experience. Yeah, and, that, and for years that has been my journey because I left that night and I didn't come back in for mm -hmm. years. So my journey has been about getting back into my body and accepting my memories. You know what? I think if I stayed in, I would have died. Mm -hmm. I really do think that um, I had to get out of the way because the trauma was horrific. They had three attempts to try to kill me, which clearly didn't work. But, you know, they made three serious attempts to end my life. And I think if I was in, I would have died. On that night when you were 13? Yeah. yeah. Fuck's sake. Yeah. That's some ordeal. Yeah. And to be sitting here and to be doing TED Talks and to be writing books and to be empowering women, it's phenomenal. You should be really proud of yourself. And to be sitting here, you're clearly doing well for yourself now that you're on a show. Um, but... It's been I've made it now, have I? I'm on the James English <laughs> show. Yay! Completed. Trevor yeah. and James. Okay. That's it. Say no to everything else. <laughs> but for coming on and telling your story, it's um, I've got massive respect for you. Thank and you. I wish you nothing but the ma massive success for the future and going forward and empowering more women to come forward, even men as well, Absolutely. Um, to get involved and come forward. And you're not alone. And I have nothing but respect for you, Madeline. Thank you it's so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. And You're thank welcome. you and all the best for the future. Thank you thank very you. much.